Okay, I promised to put up an initial PowerPoint and in no particular order, what we've got is a, uh, I guess some would say a hodgepodge of miscellaneous uh, PowerPoint slides, but this deck is just to topically speak to some elements of organizations and organizational behavior and what we will likely be looking at or including in the course this semester. So I'm gonna share uh, the PowerPoint. And okay, I see that there. So to keep this brief, we'll be spending some more time discussing this, but when we look at organizations and behavior of organizations, obviously we consider that uh, uh, organizations are an amalgamation of, of people, of individuals, of individual groups that ultimately form and comport to be the organization. And that's kind of what we see here. So uh, again, organization centric, yes, but really a function of groups and the groups and subsequently the organization, a function of the individual. So our expectations reflect kind of what's there. You know, if we have an organization, uh, and maybe this is not a great example, but an organization of bus drivers, uh, well, you know, if these bus drivers are terrible drivers, then uh, how could we be surprised that the organization is looked at in askance and and very poorly regarded and so forth. And again, while not the best example, we can envision better ones where we see the influence of the individual, we see the influence of groups and ultimately uh, the organization uh, itself. Uh, this semester, part of what we're going to be talking about uh, uh, include the inputs uh, to organizational behavior. And obviously the, the outcome of this stuff here, uh, you know, the social and behavioral sciences, which include the psychology of the individuals and in the organization, sociology, anthropology, economics, political science, and so forth, uh, is, is kind of uh, influenced or, or, you know, given steerage, if you will, uh, by the mission and work focus of the organization and the uh, influences of management. And all of that kind of comes together as an amalgamation uh, into both micro and macro behaviors. When we speak about micro, we're talking about the individual and group behaviors. And when we speak in terms of macro, we're talking about the organization and the environment. So bunch of influences, and again, in no particular order, but two major considerations of uh, individuals and subsequently organizations, individual behaviors, and subsequently organizational behavior include IQ and EQ. Now, we're all pretty familiar with IQ. You know, when we were young, we had to take an IQ test, and I know some people uh, somewhat less than affectionately uh, refer to that as a, a test to determine how smart you are or how dumb you are. And that's not really the case at all. Uh, and while this is not a course dealing with that specifically, uh, the intelligence quotient is really not what we know or what we learned or didn't learn, but it really is kind of a measure of our ability to learn, our ability to learn. And that's probably a better way to look at it because many experts consider that IQ is kind of established at birth. And while it may change minimally over time, it is not this thing of, well, uh, you know, at six, I had an IQ of three and at, at, you know, 57 years old, I have an IQ. That, that's not really the way it works. Uh, so it is not what we know. So it's not, geez, are we, and, and boy, do I, I, despise these words, but it's not how smart we are. It's not how stupid we are. It's not, it, it's not those things. It gets misused and misrepresented continuously. It really is looking at our ability to learn. And, you know, that's, that's actually, frankly, fairly comforting, you know. Uh, now, what we will learn, is that that's a 
different discussion. But IQ, kind of established at birth, according to many experts, and it changes minimally over time, versus EQ, emotional quotient, which is constantly evolving through all kinds of influences, the environment, our education, people we come in contact with. So this changes vastly over time. And again, what we do to the individual or what we experience as individuals is reflected in the organization. Other influences include some of the great theorists in management. So McGregor, for example, and I'm sure we're all familiar with that by now, but McGregor wrote about Theory X and Theory Y. And, you know, Theory X, uh, just to paraphrase a little bit, seems to be that, that really brutal, I don't know, overbearing approach to management. You know, we, we, we've seen managers like this. They're constantly over your shoulder. And he or she is a real micromanager. What, what are you doing there? Why are you using the blue pen, not the red pen? Why are you using the red pen, not the blue pen? Uh, why, why are you using letterhead for this? You know, geez, uh, 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 okay, relax, relax. A really directive personality, constant oversight, continuous direction. You're sitting sideways in the chair. You're not using the mouse. We, we purchased as an organization these so that you could do that or, uh, you know, whatever it happens to be. A really, what I would characterize almost as a robotic environment versus theory why which is and and this is my use of the word there are different interpretations and understandings of laissez-faire uh but it it laissez-faire to me uh means that it kind of and, and in that third point allows things to take their course you know so this laissez-faire theory why uh, approach is more of a a coaching type personality don't you think that uh, will apply direction primarily as requested, but once in a while as required. And, and you know, uh, it's a very relaxed skills utilization environment. Put differently, uh, I, I, when I built an MBA program at a previous institution, I had a right hand and I told her that, look, you know, you know, from time to time, you know, you're going to do something that I think probably could have been done differently or maybe even arguably should have been done differently. I know fallacy of shoulds. But um, uh, I want you to use all of your skills and abilities and intelligence and do this, whatever, you know, this happened to be. My, my favorite, f favorite phrase to her was, look, this and this just make this go away. Meaning. Use all of your skills and abilities and knowledge and education. Use who you are to solve this or fix this so that I don't have to be this theory X manager sitting over your shoulder, Mike, because, look, I hired you to be my right hand because you're smart, because you're well-educated, because, you know, whatever the reasons, you know, might be. So now I have to rely on that without sitting in your shirt pocket and telling you every single thing to do. Now, what's implicit in that, and we'll talk more about this during the semester, but just an overview today, but what's implicit in that is the notion that if I release you to your own devices and something blows up, do I then turn around and say, well, that was stupid and you should have never, and because if I do that, you will never go out on a limb again. And so what comes along with laissez-faire or theory why is trust. Trust that you're going to do the best you can and a recognition that, you know, sometimes things just suck and sometimes things just break and sometimes it just doesn't work out the way I envisioned it might but I have to be coaching and supportive and still maintain this relaxed skills utilization environment. So we'll talk a little bit about that during the uh, semester as well. There's a great, and you can research this online now, Paul Hersey was not a, a friend of mine, but he was an acquaintance. 
and he was a uh, professor when I was doing my doctoral studies. And we used to meet at this little <laughs> German Hofbrau. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's now the Courtyard uh, Marriott, you know, hotel in, in Fort Lauderdale, you know, right right on A1A. Uh, and, uh, you know, the beach right across and everything. And there was this little alleyway in between that and a series of stores. And, and it was a little German Hofbrau. And so he was there one evening with his wife, Susie, and, uh, you know, one of my colleagues and I, we would go there for dinner fairly routinely when we were, uh, you know, at the university in Fort Lauderdale. And, uh, you know, we saw him at the bar and uh, we'd had him in class earlier in the day. So we started talking about his situational leadership model. And he gave us some great insights, which I will relate uh, during the course of this course and others. I, I use it frequently. But this is an overview. And what you're talking about really is this leader-follower relationship. And he identifies different leadership, in a sense, styles, you know, S1, 2, 3, 4, and gives us, a, you know, a little perspective on that. And then we also talk about follower readiness, because nothing, um, well, that's not true. A uh, few things suck more than in an organization having... Um, a clash of these styles. We all know perhaps people we've worked for that we got along with. And so we were all very or relatively happy and very productive. And, so, and then we also know people that we, I shouldn't phrase it this way, but in a very jargony way, we hated their guts. You know, this person was a awful, you know, and, and, hated working for him. We never got along. We felt disrespected. We felt they didn't appreciate what we did. We didn't think how, and, and so on and so forth. And that's a lot of what Paul Hersey addresses in terms of organizational behavior. And so we will talk about situational leadership and the impact of these kinds of relationships between leader followers uh, during the semester. Leadership is one of the inputs, and leader styles that are congruent with followers create a positive atmosphere. Simply put, this lack of congruence creates tension, creates dis distrust, if not just outright disdain and hate, and results in typically high inefficiency. But a positive correlation between Theory X and Theory Y leaders and followers creates a positive atmosphere. There are, and I know we say, well, wait a minute, didn't we just say that Theory X was the micromanaging? You know, there are people in different positions that prefer to be directed. They're not built to take chances. They don't want to be left to their own devices. If you want this using the red pen, tell me I must use the red pen. If you want three lines on a piece of paper, tell me you want three. You know, they really want that. They, they don't want they don't want to ever be told, well, why did you do it this way? Because their safety net, their response has to always be because that's what told. And there are some people that are theory X, in a sense, followers. Now, in my experience, most people prefer more of a theory why approach, you know, appreciate me, uh, respect me for my knowledge, for my skills, for my abilities, and let me, in a sense, do my thing. But that's not everyone, and that's not everywhere. A mismatch of these McGregor theories creates the same thing, creates friction, tension, distrust, and subsequently, uh, you know, ends up with great inefficiency. Now, from the follower perspective, you know, so leaders and followers, so from the, the employees, the worker bees, well, clarity of vision is essential. And a clear vision of, you know, in other words, put differently, everybody's on board. Uh, Neutron Jack, Jack Welsh, uh, when he used to run GE, he used to go down to the plant floor. Now, I, I met him on, on two occasions, but he used to go down to the uh, plant floor, you know, whatever the manufacturing facility was, just like Henry Sharp did at, at this old company in the United States, Brown and Sharp Manufacturing. 
And uh, so Jack Walsh would go down on the floor and perhaps he'd walk up to somebody working on, on you know, a particular uh, machine making whatever it is they're making. And, you know, this, this person wrenching on whatever, you know, the machining center, cutting metal chips everywhere. And, and uh, Neutron Jack would walk up and, and he would uh, inquire of the individual, kind of like, uh, what do you do here? And the wrong answer was to say, well, I operate this machine, and when the thing does this thing to that thing, uh, you know, I do this with the wrench, and uh, and that's what I do. Talk about dumber than a bag of hammers. What Jack Welsh was asking is, how do you fit into the overall scheme of this entire operation and subsequently this organization? What is your value to the organization? And so this clarity of purpose is what leads to, I mean, frankly, profits and shareholder value. You know, now, I know, and I'm going to touch this lightly today. We'll get into it, but today is not the day. But I know in K through 12, many students have been fed this baloney about business and the purpose of the firm and so on and so on. let's be clear in let's call it american capitalism in the for-profit arena the purpose of the firm is profits and shareholder value period period and if that's going to make you run to the safe room and go pet, then then go, go pet a bunny. But recognize the reality. Now, we're not normatizing. We're not saying that's the good thing to do, the right thing to do, the wrong thing. That's not our job. But our job is analysis and understanding. Clear purpose. of the, What is the purpose of, of Ford? Oh, the purpose of Ford is to make cars. And. Eh purpose of Ford is to make profits and maximize profits and maximize shareholder value. They do it by making cars. It's the purpose of Pfizer. Oh, Pfizer to, to generate new vaccines against COVID and whatever else might be out there and all of this to help humanity. It's a publicly traded firm. Purpose of the firm, profit, shareholder value. So this clarity of mission and where we fit in and how we help deliver these outcomes is the essential component for followers, employees. A clouded perspective is purpose of the firm. Well, it's people focused and and all these soft science predicates that, uh, well, our job is to make sure that everybody can you know, everybody's got to eat. And so we come here and we, you know, there's a word I'd like to use, which decorum prevents me from using. So let's just leave it at, we'll talk about that. But it demonstrates a profound, profound lack of understanding and clarity as far as the individual's purpose in the organization. Look. We're business students. If you were really into soft, touchy-feely, probably you should be a psychology major, not a business major. Business is tough. It is the conflict between dollars and cents and... We'll talk more. One of the things we'll look at during the course of the semester is the assessment matrix that, you know, in a sense emanates from Paul Hersey and the Hersey Blanchard situational leadership model. And we categorize uh, individuals into one of four boxes, able and willing, able and unwilling, unable but willing and unable and unwilling. What does that mean? 
Well, Abel. So we've hired someone that is qualified, professionally, academically qualified to do whatever it is you know we need to have done. And they're willing to do it. In other words, they're motivated. They're good at what they do. They want to get into this thing. They look forward to doing this versus able and unwilling. You know, they know the job, they're well-trained professionally and academically, but the unwilling part, that's, that's the stuff where you get, ah, oh, well, they don't pay me enough. That's not my job. Then you have the unable but willing. Now, these, these top two are the people you're looking for. Unable but willing. Unable but willing. In other words, they don't have the skill set, but they're trainable and willing to be trained. And they are willing to walk on broken glass for you. Extraordinary. That's the individual that you want. These two. Versus unable and unwilling. Well, if they don't know the job and they have a bad attitude and aren't interested in doing anything for you, you know, why would you even consider them? And, and I guess that's really the point. So when we look at it, it, it breaks down this way. And we'll spend more time, you know, talking about that. Um, People are just motivated differently, you know, and, and it translates into that able and willing, able and up, you know, blah, blah, blah. But there are things that we'll discuss that uh, involve the notion of extrinsic motivation and intrinsic motivation. And simply put, extrinsic motivation, well motivated to perform an activity to earn a reward or to avoid punishment versus intrinsic motivation, motivated to perform an activity for its own sake and personal rewards like belonging to the executive dining room or being part, you know, you, you get the idea and we'll put some more meat on the bones with that. So put differently, intrinsic uh, motivators, well, autonomy, belonging, curiosity, love, learning, you know, this kind of stuff. Extrinsic, we're looking for badges, we're looking for a pay raise, we're looking for money, gold stars, uh, specific rewards, a preferred parking space. And again, our job is not to, in a sense, normatize, but analyze. You know, it's not our job to say, well, this is good and this is bad and this is right and this is wrong. You know, we all have opinions clearly, but that's that's not what we're here to do. We're here to analyze and see how that impacts organizations, organizational behavior, and organizational outcomes. So, especially, now we've all said it probably from time to time, but you ever hear the expression, hey, look, I don't get paid enough to do that, or that's not my job, you know, that, that version, no my job, all right? Those are the people you fire immediately. No questions asked. Out the door. You're fired. You're fired, you're fired, you're fired, and you, and you, and you, and you. Why? And we'll spend some time with this during the semester. But, you know, remember the expression, or maybe you don't because it's a really old one, but rotten apple, you know, will spoil, you know, the whole barrel. It's that kind of a theory, and we'll spend some time with that. We're going to spend time with the notion of government versus corporate. And this speaks back to that, you know, shareholder, excuse me a sec, that max profits shareholder thing. We, I think, as a society have become very confused about everybody's role and expectations, I think, are skewed. Purpose of the firm in the context I spoke of earlier is to maximize profitability. The owners of the firm, the shareholders, are the primary concern. That's the way it is. So we embrace things like low-cost labor. Well, we want to keep jobs here. No, we want to go, if, if we need muscle labor, we want to go where muscle labor is cheap. You know, it used to be China. Today, it's more like you know, Singapore, Vietnam, Malaysia, so on and so forth. But, but you know, we used to, refer, <clears throat> excuse me, used to refer to it as the China price. Not meant offensively, that was the published phrase that was being used at the time. So the China price, 
all right, low-cost labor. We're interested in low taxes. Well, corporate, we're not interested in that. Raise the taxes, we'll leave the country. How about that? Uh, minimal regulation. Well, we need uh, uh, scrubbers and cleaners on the smokestacks, and everybody has to have a blue suit with a pink visor with a, a, a you know what? Get away from me with that nonsense. All that does is add cost. And our primary objective is this marginal analysis, cost versus profit. And we'll talk more about that during the semester. But that's, that's the corporate side of the divide. The government side of the divide, which in my personal view fails miserably, is where we ought to be firing the shots, because that's where the failure is. It's not up to General Electric or General Motors or, or whomever to create self-regulation about clean air and clean. No, that's a government responsibility. If the government does a crappy job, it's not me, the corporation, who has to, oh, well, look, they did a crappy job here, so I'm going to have to. No, 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 no fire the people that need to be fired. And, and I would argue it ends up right over here. Their responsibility is to maximize opportunity, create or at least create an environment for a robust economy, create a standard of living for you and I that is, is tenable, that is enjoyable, that is good, whatever that might be. They have the responsibility, this, you know, the government entities, this day, that's what it, you know, I'm, I'm speaking of when I say they here, but they have the responsibility, the social responsibility for health care, for housing, for food, for education. You know, my son has a small and hopefully will grow over time, not for profit. And I hope I get through this without tearing up because this thing really breaks my heart. But uh, we, na we named it. We named it Full Belly Tonight. Because when he was going through all the crap that I think, you know, was more predominant in your generation than mine, you know, he ended up, you know, uh, you know in, in different places and, and all this stuff. Point being that we constantly were coming across, you're all young to me, but young kids in... In, in this particular instance, and we call it P-Town, but Patterson, New Jersey, who were starving. And homeless. And there was one day where we were driving by, uh, uh, there's a McDonald's in, in, Patterson, this particular one, and doesn't matter. I could give you the street address. I know it well. And there were a bunch of teenage kids on the corner. And, you know, the traffic light would turn red and they would come up just asking for coin or whatever it was. And the one kid, you know, he looked and he said, look, I haven't eaten in three days. And my son and I, you know, just. Uh, pulled into the McDonald's. I sent my son in with a bunch of money, and I don't know, we bought bags of Big Macs and stuff like this. Probably not healthy, so. <laughs> but I, I guess it sure beats starving. And my son went out and handed these, uh, you know, to the kids there. And this is a few years ago, and, and that day we decided, because we used the phrase, you know, said, God, these poor kids and this and that, and the parents probably kicked him out for this, you know, whatever the reasons. I got to get off this slide, but the expression we used in the car was, well, at least they'll have a full belly tonight. And that's how this thing was started. I'll get through this slide. So when I bitch about government, that's what I'm bitching about. That's somebody's responsibility.
that's somebody's responsibility. We'll talk more. So there is a big myth about corporate social responsibility, which I want to entertain this semester and deal with. But at least when I throw stones and I get pissed off, as we all do, about those kinds of things, because I, obviously I would think we all, if you've got half a heart, believe in feed the foodless and house the homeless. I don't want to sound glib about it, but where I start throwing stones is, uh, you know, right there. And, uh, you know, we will we'll talk about that. All right, uh, let's get through the rest of this relatively quickly because we'll spend time. The reason it breaks up sometimes is something called the Iron Triangle or an Iron Triangle. And I'm going to post these slides and I want you to look at this one and we will have a healthy discussion. But this, as much as anything else, influences organizations, be they congressional bodies, private corporations, little clubs, uh, individuals, you and I. And we will spend time on that. Uh, <clears throat> we will spend some time, and those of you that have had class with me before, sappy top. Yes, we're visiting that again, but particularly from the environmental perspective, and that's this side of the calculus. And, you know, again, uh, there is the firm or the organization, and then there's, in a sense, the whole rest of the world, the environment. I started to mention improvisation because I do want to spend some time with that. So we will be talking about uh, the Grateful Dead as an influential partner in improvisational leadership and management. And that, of course, will force us to look at improvisation and what it is. And at the end of the day, uh, you know, being in the moment, in a sense, uh, drives us to these 10 improvisation tips and so forth. And that's, you know, uh, th there are some more slides on a second deck. That's not for today. So I want to uh, uh, get out of that deck. Obviously, uh, I apologize uh, to you for uh, the escape of emotion there. But uh, two things make me absolutely crazy. Well, crazier. You know, I'm just going to say crazy, but crazier. And that is... Uh, you know, uh, food issues and, and homelessness makes me absolutely nuts. So I, I, I know I'm a business professor and, you know, capitalist and, and all of this stuff, but um, as, as do most of us, there is a conflict between art and business. And, you know, if you can't find a way through, then you belong in a different uh, discipline because you'll get eaten up alive. Anyway, uh, that's the uh, first PowerPoint that I wanted to introduce. Uh, again, I'll stop here. Blessings to all. And uh, we'll chat again very soon. Enjoy your day.